looking forward to our time together, and I want to thank uh, Chuck and Milton in particular, but all the others who helped make this event, uh, put this event together today. And uh, I, I've had some uh, good lunches with uh, with them to talk about United Methodist Men. That was the term that we were talking about at the time. But uh, but also the uh, the just just some of what's going on in the life of the annual conference and in men's ministry in uh, in particular. I. Uh, I also want to just begin by um, expressing my appreciation to each one of you for taking the time to give up a, a pretty full day when I'm sure you have many other things you could do, but to do, uh, but to spend time focused on discipleship and especially discipleship with men and how to strengthen the men's ministry in your church and in your community. So that represents a love for Christ, a love for the church that, uh, that I honor and respect. So thank you for that. Um, my first memories of United Methodist Men. Let's just go back in time for a while. I was uh, I was 15, 16 year old, years old in Del Rio, Texas, when my father uh, became the president of the Methodist Men in that church, and I, at the same time, was president of the MYF, the Methodist Youth Fellowship. And so they, this was big news in Del Rio. So there's a news clipping of a picture from the Del Rio News Herald of my dad and I standing together, the president of the Methodist Man and the president of, uh, of the MYF. That, uh, in those days, what Methodist Man was in that particular community, and this may sound familiar with uh, some of uh, ministries that you've been familiar with along the way, is it was, uh, it was a monthly dinner. And, uh, and it was uh, cooked by the men. Uh, they sometimes had a guest speaker, sometimes not. And they tried to get as many people involved and to come to that as possible. And, um, and I came to a few of those meetings too. I think I even was asked to speak when I was a teenager. Uh, and they do things like have these, uh, w w like once a year have some bigger event. And so I remember one that was, uh, was going to be a fish fry out on Lake Almastad. And uh, how I was going to go is we were all going to get in boats and go over to an island where they'd have all the grills and stuff set up and ready to, to go. And they needed more boats than just members of the group had, so they recruited some of their fishing buddies. And this is back in the days when, you know, what a boat was is something you <laughs> you started like this rather than, <laughs> rather than like this. And, uh, and so one of these folks who's just, you know, a, a fisherman and friend of somebody, he, uh, he couldn't get his boat started. And I was standing next to uh, Reverend Platt. And, uh, and my dad and these other men were around. This guy couldn't get his boat started and he was giving out blue smoke and just, you know, he couldn't. And he got frustrated and he just let out this blue streak himself. And uh, and everybody immediately looked at Reverend Platt and then me because I was the youth, <laughs> uh, as if I hadn't heard some of that stuff some places before. But uh, and and Reverend Platt uh, looked over me and said, you know, sometimes people just have to talk to things to get them to work. <laughs> uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't intimidated or put off by that. He was a Marine Corps. Uh, veteran from a land in Iwo Jima, so, uh, so he was, uh, he'd heard some of those words before, I'm sure. <laughs> it started, we, we, we got there somehow. So, um, so that's the kind of, uh, even when I was serving as a pastor, uh, my, my first pastorate, the, uh, the person who kind of ran, uh, ran Methodist Man was, uh, well actually I would go to McAllen for, uh, was Ralph Fletcher, and uh, he's, he passed away many years ago. But uh, but Methodist Man kind of revolved around him because he was the one that got there early on. I, you know, it was like a Thursday morning to have a six o'clock uh, breakfast, so that if any working men were a part of it, they could get to work in time. And he'd smell bacon throughout, you know, the place and uh, fixing these uh, these breakfasts up. Uh, eventually that faded away and how it faded away is all those who were had responsible positions in it uh, just aged out right and there weren't people to take the place now they tried they'd often try and recruit younger men you know won't you come to six o'clock breakfast on a Thursday morning 
but that wasn't catching on the way it did in their generation. It, it didn't have the charm for younger generations as it had for them. And, um, and so the, the reason I'm starting with these old stories is, um, is, is just to, where I'm going to go with this is highlight how different the world is today and how many of the things that worked 50 years ago or 40 years ago or 30 years ago really have very little chance of working today. And you know that. You've probably had speakers here today say something like that. Um, but why is it? Why is what worked, what used to work, doesn't work anymore? Well, there's a thousand reasons, but, but one of them is the very nature of membership organizations. You think of other community organizations, Masons or, um, or you know, even Rotary or Lions Clubs, all those have faced the same thing, this, this idea of you move to a community and, uh, and you're going to join this organization and you're going to be committed to it in various ways. And, uh, and it has certain expectations, and you're going to kind of pay your dues, but also participate in various things. That, that model just doesn't work as well anymore with younger generations. They're not a, a I want to be a member of that uh, kind of mindset for the most part. Um, so another reason why this model doesn't work very well anymore if we're stuck in that kind of older model is uh, what made those membership organizations work, and especially the church work, is the whole culture uh, supported engagement in the church, involvement in the church. It's, um, I like to say that in the 1950s, 1960s, the, regardless of what kind of community you were in, or what, uh, you know, black, white, Hispanic, there was a, there was a cultural sense that, uh, that helped support church involvement. I like to say that in the 1950s and early 1960s, it was like a dump truck drove through the neighborhood and gathered up all the people and pulled up to the front steps of the church and dumped out all and they rolled into the pews and there they'd sit. Culture supported church. <coughs> Nowadays, culture is like a vacuum cleaner attached to the front door of the church that just sucks people out, right? Now, what do I mean by that? I want to play out a scenario in. in uh, in, in your imagination. Imagine uh, 19, uh, 1950s, 60s, uh, even 70s, and that, uh, that you're a, an athlete on a high school team and, uh, and you're facing the big championship and the coach says, I just wish we could get one more practice in before the big game. And you raise your hand and he says, I have an idea, coach. Let's practice on Sunday. How would the coach have responded? No way. You, you, you boys be in church. <laughs> you, ought to, you ought to be in church. I'm going to be in church. Now, it's not that everybody went to church, but everybody thought they should be. But, and, and just the mores were of that, of that, cult, that cultural uh, tradition was just such that there was this expectation that you belong to a church somehow. This, uh, uh, I mean, compare that today where uh, sometimes I uh, just worship with my wife to hear uh, Lupina preach over at Northern Hills. And, uh, and, and the service is at 11, so I'll have time to get up early and go to McAllister Park and take a long walk. You know what starts happening at Mount McAllister Park on Sunday morning about 8 o'clock? It's just hundreds and hundreds of cars. All these uh, parents and youngsters are carrying uh, what do you call them, uh, like uh, lounge chair, uh, um, outdoor chairs, and they're setting up in groups and they're watching, and there's just thousands of people. Now, if, uh, if one of those young people said to a coach, coach, uh, I'm not gonna be able to be here for two Sundays in a row because my family's part of a singing group and we're gonna be singing on those two Sundays, a special time in our church. You know what the response tends to be now? Well, if, if you're not, if you can't come to the practices, you can't play the games, right? Are you with us or not? See how different the pressures are of the culture around us? And that doesn't take it, that doesn't even include uh, Starbucks and all the things. You want to 
you want to see where the crowd is on Sunday morning, you stop by a Starbucks in some communities, or diners, breakfast, um, taquerias. It's, a, a, it, it, it's shoulder to shoulder in some of those places because that's the free day to go do what you want to do. And, uh, and so this idea, let's just wait for that dump truck to go dump people on our front steps, that doesn't work anymore. And has it for a long, long time. But we, get, we have this kind of nostalgia for the way things used to be often. So uh, many of our churches have somewhere, you know, in the basement or in the attic or someplace, uh, a framed picture of what the men's Bible class was like from 1957. And whatever space it is, the sanctuary or gymnasium, or something, it is packed with men with suits and ties, right? And we look back and say, those were the good old days. Why can't we be like that anymore? Well, they weren't all the good old days, uh, days, you know, either in our culture or in the church. But we look back and I say, why can't we go back? Why can't we do that again? Well, uh, it's not going to happen. That's not the way men affiliate. That's not the way uh, they, they learn and grow in grace and the knowledge and love of God. That kind of, that kind of gathering uh, just doesn't work, doesn't have that magic that it used to. Um, this, uh, this also, I, I mentioned membership, and I'm going to make a distinction here. By the way, some of this may, may kind of, uh, almost, maybe something you haven't heard before, may even kind of offend you a little bit. Well, what's a bishop talking about this for? But here's, uh, when I started in ministry, my first internship experience was in 1981. Is that right? 1980. And um, and I learned how to uh, do evangelism in that era, which I was uh, like an associate pastor position at a larger church, and they had a group led by laity that was called the MVs, which stood for Monday Visitors. And what would happen is on uh, is on Monday evening, a group of about six or eight lay people would gather in, uh, in this woman's house, and she would have gone through the registration pads the day before, and she would have who the visitors were. And, uh, and she would keep track of all these, but she'd give two cards to these two people, and three cards to those two people, and, uh, and then they'd uh, and tell whatever she knew about, it, and then they'd drive out and they'd visit people in their homes who had come to church the day before. And, uh, and invite them back to church and get to know them and come and report in to, uh, to Lynn who was running this. And she would write on the card, you know, the, the progress of this person. And you know what? Uh, the, the, the anticipation was that if we kind of uh, followed up then, followed up again in two or three weeks, that at some point they will stand at the, the front of the church and join the church. They will become a member of the church. And it's like, bingo. We're finished with that person. And that was really kind of the mindset. The goal was to make members, to make people into members of the church. And, uh, and I had to almost unlearn that within five years and see that the role of the church is not just to make members, but to, uh, to help them grow in the grace and knowledge and love of God, to help them grow in discipleship. And already, already at the... Uh, it, it, at my age at that time, you were seeing the shift and the way we built a young person's group in the first church I served was, uh, was, not, by, uh, was not by doing the MVs model, but instead was by meeting in people's homes and starting a Bible study with young couples or uh, young singles or something. And so that shift was already taking place, but it's that more evidence that, that the membership type of model as a goal isn't uh, just isn't sufficient and hasn't been for a long, long time. And then there are the changes in society that have taken place over the years. And I, there isn't much to see on this chart, and those on the periphery may have to look up there for it. But uh, this is not to scale; it's just uh, meant to suggest how this goes. You don't want to invest in that company? No, <laughs> that's just a joke. So that is uh, 
That's the general trend of uh, participation in uh, Christian churches and uh, any, in any religious institutions uh, over about a 50 or 60 year period. Now, there was a time, Celeste, we used to talk about this being, main, we, whenever we draw a chart like this, we talk about the mainline denominations, you know, Methodist, Episcopal, Lutheran, and stuff. That, now it's virtually all generations, and a matter of fact, it's most faiths. For the first time in surveys uh, done by uh, the people that research this kind of stuff, the largest uh, religious affiliation are nuns. Not N-U-N-S, like the habit, but the people who, what's your religious affiliation, mark none. Right? Um, and a subtotal of those nuns are what I call duns. They're done with church. That something has, uh, has uh, rubbed them wrong about church, or they've been hurt, or they have a friend that's been hurt by church, and they're just not coming. They're done with church. And so, everybody under this line, in this little drawing, are folks that still affiliate with churches, and the number's going down, and who still value uh, belonging to communities of faith. Uh, but the trend has been going down. Now, everybody above the line uh, are, are folks that don't, many of whom cannot imagine seeing themselves crossing uh, the threshold of a church and going in a church building. Are you with me? Yeah. Now here's the puzzling part, is during this same period of time, there's been this other line, and that has been the interest in spirituality the interest in the interior life, the interest in service, the interest in doing what it takes to have, a, to have an inner peace, the interest in doing what it takes to, have a, to, to, to serve and make a positive difference in the lives of other people. That has grown during the same time that church participation has gone down. Um, so that creates some interesting things on this chart. <laughs> um, what that means is there are people out here who have an active interest in spirituality, but they can't imagine themselves going to a church service. I, uh, as, a, as a writer who's been writing for more than 30 years, I, the, the most concrete example I can give is if you went in one of the bookstores that we still had 30 years ago, Walden Books, Dalton, Bookstop, <laughs> one of those stores, and you went to their religious section, what you'd find was a single bookshelf that would have two rows of Bibles and then a mixture of other literature. You go in Barnes and Noble today, and look, first of all, it won't necessarily be religion, it'll be religion and spirituality or something, and it will cover a whole wall. Now, help me understand. I mean, now there's a mix in that. Some of those are pretty off-the-wall kinds of things, but, uh, but people are hungry for something. People are searching for something, but they're not finding it in the churches. And so this, uh, if you want to have fun with this chart, uh, the folks underneath both these lines are the folks who are still uh, active in communities of faith, but also have an active interest in deepening their spirituality. I mean, they're, they're driven by something inside them. Right? Out here you have that searching, but not necessarily related to communities of faith. Uh, in this part right up here, well those are folks that just kind of don't care either about the church or about spirituality. It's just not their thing. Okay? This is an interesting little place here, because those would be people who belong to churches, but aren't necessarily driven by an inner spiritual uh, seeking or yearning. As one writer called them, um, they're kind of citizens of the church. They kind of come to church to fulfill their duty. They're going to help out when they can, but they're, but they're not really investing a great part of themselves to deepen their faith, right? So these are some of the dynamics that we, uh, that we face now. And, and so this, this idea that we've had for so many years, that worked back in the 50s and 60s, that we just need to sit and do things better, and those people out there will come here and like the things we like and do the things we do. 
that just doesn't work anymore. You know, it's, uh, I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I, I'm not a Starbucks freak, but I, and I'm not even, not even a coffee drinker, I drink tea. But every once in a while, I'll stop by a Starbucks and order a, you know, hot tea, and I'm looking at the person behind the counter, and I'm thinking about the age differences, you know, usually early 20s, often early 20s. I'm thinking about the other kind of cultural differences, uh, interesting tattoos and piercings and, and, and uh, hair, haircuts and say, and I'm thinking all the things that make this person's life so different from my life, right? And, uh, and I think, so in my own heart and soul, when I'm thinking about this person's well-being and, and my hope and prayer that uh, sometime they'll, uh, they'll have some kind of experience that will help them uh, grasp or receive God's grace in some way, right? What am I really hoping for? I'm hoping that this person that I just described wakes up some Sunday morning and instead of going to work says, you know, I just had this epiphany, this amazing moment when I realized that I have deep inside myself this lifelong hunger for, for uh, organ music with a special focus on Wesleyan hymnody. <laughs> right? Where can I find a church like that? And so they, they leave their job and say, I can't work on Sundays, and they start driving around to find a church that does it. Is that ever going to happen with that person? It's just incredibly unlikely, right? That is no judgment on organists or choirs or traditional churches or whatever. It's just that whatever causes that person to deepen their spirituality and maybe even take a small step toward the church, it's going to be some slightly different expression of church than what formed most of us in this room. Um, it's a different day. So these folks are interested in spirituality. They're even, interestingly enough, interested in Jesus, but not necessarily the church. They even have an interest in the Bible sometimes, but not necessarily showing up on Sunday morning. And boy, that just makes us, it's hard for us to get our minds around <laughs> because our every instinct is to invite them. Now, everything I'm saying about church also applies to some kind of form of men's ministry. That if what we're thinking is uh, we just have a better program, the young men that work in Starbucks are going to come to their senses and come listen to what we present. That's not really going to happen that way. It's going to take a lot of kind of creativity. And a lot of this, uh, instead of waiting for them to come to us, thinking about how can we go to them, how can we, how can we form relationships that are meaningful, uh, sustaining, that, that causes that, that are authentic, that causes some element of trust, so that uh, so that we can explore deeper things. When I was serving uh, the church in McAllen, I remember uh, uh, we uh, tried to launch a new young adult Sunday school uh, class, and this was this was many years ago now, um, and we uh, we sent out all kinds of things to the university that was near us. We, uh, we accumulated all kinds of names of younger people in their 20s and 18 and uh, 18 and 25 just sent out all kinds of notices. And we got some young cool person to, uh, to kind of teach it. And, uh, and they just, uh, and after like this list of 80 people, like 30 show up at a, at a, a home dinner, like a barbecue or something, just to introduce and say, hey, we're starting this class. And then, uh, and then they start the first Sunday school class, and you know, nine forty-five on Sunday morning, and about ten of those fifty would show up. And the second week, you know, five. And the third week, uh, two. And then it's really started going downhill. <laughs> you know? And uh, and we had to stop and think about what were we asking these folks to do? We're asking folks that had very little nominal church relationship to shake up your schedule, come into a place that you feel entirely uncomfortable about, uh, go upstairs and follow signs, sit around tables, 
and pull out a Bible that you're unfamiliar with and, uh, and start a discussion about personal things. That's just a, that's a huge leap, isn't it? But that's the way we, that's the way we got into this when we were young, but it's, it's not working that way anymore. So, uh, so this means we've got to be uh, thinking about other ways in which we form. Oh, well, let me finish that, uh, that story. So some months later, we tried exactly the same thing with exactly the same results. And then uh, a couple stepped forward who were in their 50s, lower 50s. And they'd say, we'd like to start a group for that same group, a, a, a kind of, some kind of gathering for that same group. And we'd like to, uh, uh, we'd like the blessing of the church to do this. Uh, they were well-respected folks. Of course you can do this. Um, they began with just relationships, dinners and things like that with this group. And what was interesting is how, though especially young couples, just attached to these folks who are in their 50s. Because many of them wanted to have a relationship with someone who had more experience in life, with marriage, with work, with children, with starting a family. They wanted, they wanted a kind of life mentor, spiritual mentor, um, but they weren't finding that in their own parents mostly because they were the children of their parents, <laughs> and, and often that's not the place to find it. So they started this, and it just uh, it began to, uh, to really thrive. Um, nowadays, there are all kinds of approaches toward, uh, toward this. There's a, uh, I remember someone saying, uh, they, uh, they had a neighbor move into their neighborhood, and, uh, and the first thing they did was, uh, had somebody new move into their neighborhood, the first thing they did is invite them to church. And the people, <laughs> we're not church people at all, no way. I mean, it was just, it was cold and abrupt. Um, sometimes later, sometime later, they, um, they had this idea of just inviting a few of the neighbors together in their home for dinner. And when they did that, they opened that with a prayer and then closed it with anybody have any prayer concerns. And this couple came, right? Uh, we, we'll have so much fun, let's do it again next month. And what evolved is pretty soon taking a book or a scripture story and discussing it some after dinner and then having prayers. It's like a formed a little church. And the same people who said, no way am I going to church, we're not church people we're beginning to relate to the body of Christ. There's a book uh, out there called The Art of Neighboring. Some of you have heard me mention it before. And, uh, and the real clincher in this is this chart that's, uh, that's rather convicting that he has you draw, the, the authors have you draw. And so there's nine, uh, nine squares here. And in the middle, is your home. And this square represents the people who live across the street from you. This one, the people who live to the right of you. This one, the alley behind you, and then Caddy Wampus. So there's eight people there. Now you can do this with an apartment. Uh, not all, you know, not all. They have ghost lighting, I was told when I walked in today. So if that comes and goes, it's not part of the light show that supports my presentation. <laughs> But they, uh, they have you draw out these eight boxes, and then they have you uh, answer three questions about each box. Number one, do you know their names of the people that live right there in relationship to you? Do you know the names of people that live behind you? Uh, sometimes people do pretty good. They get four or five of those. The second is, do you know anything about them that you would not just uh, glean from seeing them, uh, you, you know, across the driveway. In other words, you see them come and go, so you know what kind of car they drive, you maybe know they have two kids and a dog, but, but is there any other information you know that you could not just obviously see? Okay? And then the third question is, have you 
had a conversation or an experience with them. That's the eight people, families, couples, whatever, that live in your immediate vicinity. Now some of us are uh, no longer spring chickens and maybe we've lived in the same location for 30 years and so they say, well, everybody knows their neighbors, all their neighbors, right? But you know, when people do this test, um, this little quiz here, it's something like two to three percent that can fill in all eight boxes with that information. I know their name, I know a couple of things about them, and we've actually had a conversation. Well, I'm, where I'm going with this, <laughs> I'm going to chase the light here, is, <laughs> is that um, the way your discipleship, the form it may take, may be different from just how do we get people to come to our men's event at church. It may be, how do I just form relationships with folks around me in a genuine way and, uh, and foster the kind of relationship and trust that, that we, kind of work, we enter each other's lives. And that's, a, that's more nebulous than the, you know, the Thursday evening dinner once a month. But it's, uh, it's not about, like, when we talk about the purpose of the Methodist Church, Mission United Methodist Church, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, that, that's taken from the, the passage where Jesus says, uh, go and make disciples. Uh, and, and the actual kind of underlying language is less about making disciples like creating a product and more go disciple. Go Go be a disciple and live the kind of life that Jesus lived that draws people toward us in, into the community. Um, so there's a, there are a lot of creative ministries going on now that are more around affinities that are not at the church location. Uh, we have a church in Austin where the pastor um, is a hiker and uh, has a few people in his church that are hikers. And I forget what they call it, but, uh, but like twice a month, he sends out over the internet in all these hiking groups, not church groups, but all these hiking uh, networks, that hey, at three o'clock we're meeting uh, on Sunday at this particular state park or this particular place, and it'll, be, it'll change up. And then when they get there, it's this kind of gathering of people some have been there before, and others who this is their first time, they're just responding to it. And what they do is they, uh, they like read a scripture or a thought, and then they talk about it as they climb up to wherever they're climbing. And when they get there, they have some simple lunch, and they, uh, they talk about, among the whole group, about what they talked about when they went up the, the mountain, you know, hill by hill, I mean, uh, two by two. And then, um, and then they uh, uh, they have a prayer, and uh, and they walk back down the trail, uh, kind of two by two, to continue any conversation that they want to have about it. Does that count as church? Well, uh, it's it's not eleven o'clock worship, but as far as deepening faith, making connection. Um, we're, we're not trying to make members out of people, quote unquote, so much as help them in their discipleship. There's, a, there's another church I'm aware of that uh, had a men's group that, um, that would meet each, uh, each one, one day a week in the evening, and they were kind of trying to think of the best place to meet, and they would just get together. And it was kind of a Bible study, pray for one another group. It was fairly informal. Uh, many of you have been a part of those. You're probably a part of those now. And this particular group, as they were thinking about where to meet, the church hosts this, uh, uh, has, a, has like a, a basketball court where uh, certain evenings, it's just full of young men in, very, in various leagues. Of, and, and we're talking about not high school or middle school or something. We're talking about 
uh, college age, 20s, uh, young married, I mean, just a mix of folks. Where that just, this little, this gymnasium area just fills up on that day. And, uh, and so one of the men had the idea, why don't we do our Bible study uh, where we're right next to that and where we see them, we, we talk to them coming and going, they see what we're doing, and let's just, we're not going to go out there and pull them off the basketball court and say, come to Bible study. What they're going to do is just be a men's group, be a men's Christian community in the presence of these younger folks. And what happened as time went on is, uh, is, is it was very intentional that they would spend time greeting and welcoming the, the men that were coming to play basketball. Uh, when they'd ask, well, what are y'all doing in there? They'd say, well, it's a time of prayer and, and, uh, and scripture. And if you want to join us, you're, you're invited. And so this, this, this suddenly started um, happening that, that, that they were reaching men in a whole different way than they had before simply by thinking, where are the young men? And, and how can we uh, kind of bear witness to who we are uh, in their presence and to, uh, and to show them the love of Christ. I, uh, it, it's, uh, some of this takes getting back to what, um, what the purpose is of any of the groups that we try to put together in a church. Um, why do, we, why do we think that group ministry of some sort is valuable? For one thing, Jesus taught us to learn in community. He, he sent his disciples out two by two to every town and place where he himself decided to, uh, intended to go. Why did he send them out two by two? Because he knew it was his only struggle to, to walk the faith. And so what did those two people talk about as they're on the road to a place they've never been before with a message that's still new to them uh, to, a, to a, a community that's likely hostile to that message, right? They talk each other into it. They talk each other into it. You know, uh, I'll be right behind you, way behind you. you know? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, I'll be praying for you. We'll be praying for each other. Uh, what happens if this happens? Well, you're going to be okay. God's with us. Okay. Well, multiply that not two by two, but a group of five people or 12 people that, that meet regularly to share the scriptures, to, uh, to talk about their journey of faith, and to talk about the next step forward. It's, uh, Jesus taught us to learn in groups like that. Um, and, it's, and there's a built-in accountability with that kind of discipleship. What do you suppose those two folks, those two disciples talked about when they left a place after having taught there or ministered there? Accountability is like, I can't believe you said that. You know, or I saw the way you were looking at her. Come on, brother, we need to talk, right? There's an accountability. And that, uh, and, and so that's part of the reason that it's, it matters to create uh, space for men to uh, to gather that is safe, that is encouraging, that uh, that and uh, <laughs> so another thing that people are are searching for. It's not just community, but it's uh, and spirituality. What's the meaning of this? Where am I going? Why is this bad? It's, it's that they want to live a life that matters. They want to do something that actually makes a positive difference in the lives of other people. And that's why uh, so many uh, service projects, the, uh, many of the strongest elements of men's ministry in the churches I've served were the relationships that were formed by people who were active in the church and people who had very little relationship with the church as they were drawn into a common project, as they were working on wheelchair ramps, as they were working in disaster relief, as they were actually uh, doing something like that. Um, it's, um, uh, it, I can, I, you know, I can still picture the people and name some of them 
who the only thing they participated in our church, I was at the same church for 16 years, was to show up with gloves in hand, toolbox, and to work alongside other folks. Now, sometimes when I talk about those kinds of examples, you're saying, well, wait a second, you mean they didn't come to church? Well, the choice, especially in younger generations, when I talk about the hiking trail and the, the basketball thing, the choice isn't, would we rather have them in church rather than talking to men at the basketball court or taking the hike or being on the work project? It's rather, would we rather have them taking the hike, working on the work project, or talking at the basketball uh, game or nothing? Does that make sense? I've got two sons, 27 and 30 years old. Um, they're doing their best to live the Christian life, you know? But every once in a while something happens and they'll say something like, which is, which is like I, uh, uh, it's like I, it, it kind of hurts almost as a, being a bishop and a pastor today, <laughs> of, of, you know, say, it's already so hard to be a Christian and be young. And, uh, and, and, and so they're, they're trying, but, but it's like swimming upstream. That dump truck isn't picking them up and taking them to church. <laughs> it's, it's, like, uh, it's like they really, and they need mentors, and they need uh, relationships. They need folks who listen to them. They need folks to learn from. And, uh, and I just think that's so important. So uh, I've just been kind of laying out some of my thinking, the, the kind of the lay of the land, some of the challenges of men's ministry these days. Um, I also want to take it just another notch, and that's to talk about, well, what's the purpose of a conference, United uh, a men's group? What, what's the, where does that come in? Um, it's, uh, it's good to be together with other friends who are working on the same stuff. It's good to form these relationships. We gather encouragement from one another. The main reason, though, for having this at a conference level is to help strengthen and teach and learn how to do more effective ministry at the, at the local level. That it's, uh, that it's in the local congregations, in the community, it's in the place that God has placed you uh, in, in ministry that, that the real work gets done. And when we come to these events, it's to learn and sharpen up and be encouraged for doing things a little differently uh, back at home. Um, it's a privilege to serve as your bishop. And I appreciate uh, all that you do. I give God thanks for every one of you. All that you do for the United Methodist Church, for the purposes of Christ. It's not an easy time to walk the Christian walk. It's not an easy time for us to reach across some of the generational differences and, uh, and help in forming disciples and being disciples with younger generations. But don't give up. It matters. It's uh, it's very important. Yes. We got a, a new young pastor at our church, and uh, I wondered if uh, you would have an opportunity to encourage a new pastor to consider visiting the United Methodist Men's Group. It's hard for pastors to come. To the yeah. The man is a male pastor, by the way. Yeah. So. Um, so I, when I'm with pastors, I encourage that kind of thing. However, I, I would, I would just remind you that United United Methodist Men is fundamentally a lay led organization, and that's its strength. And and I'm not saying you uh, you know insinuated this or something, but it, it can't rest on the pastor's shoulders. Uh, and 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 so it's just uh, it, it it you know back in the old days it was. Uh, Mr. Fletcher getting up early in the morning and cooking those breakfasts and making those phone calls the, the day before and all of that. Now it has a different form, but it, it fundamentally rests with, uh, with men to men in a congregation. However, same reason I'm here today <laughs> is, is, there is a, uh, there's a kind of blessing that comes when, uh, when the clergy leader uh, you know, at least attends or participates at some level. Yeah. 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 It's, it's 
it's not, I'm not saying that they should yeah. this. I'm just saying, yeah. be present. Yes. Well, I'll tell you that. We 